Test 6. I am going to give you the instructions for this test. I shall introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. You will hear each piece twice. Remember, while you are listening, write your answers on the question paper. You will have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There will now be a pause. Please ask any questions now, because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer, A, B, or C. Question one. You are at a college lecture when you hear this student interrupting the lecturer. Which was highly controversial anyway, and of course, if you consider the implication of this new law, uh, yes? Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said something very important about the core laws, and I was just wondering... Actually, they were the corn laws. You know the agricultural plant? Oh, sorry, I missed some of what you said. It was very fast. Could you possibly go back over this? Well, no, you'll find all of that in my book... Price fifteen ninety nine at the college bookshop. Now, where was I? Which was highly controversial anyway, and of course, if you consider the implication of this new law, uh, yes? Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said something very important about the core laws, and I was just wondering... Actually, they were the corn laws. You know the agricultural plant? Oh, sorry, I missed some of what you said. It was very fast. Could you possibly go back over this? Well, no, you'll find all of that in my book, Price fifteen ninety nine at the College Bookshop. Now, where was I? Question 2. You hear this politician being interviewed on TV. No doubt, all of you listening are worried about taxes, and so you should be. The Christian Democratic Alliance have said nothing about their plans to alter the tax brackets, and these are changes that will go straight to the pockets of hard-working people like yourselves, and we all know where the social liberal Democrats stand on this issue. They'll be taxing everything in sight. However, we in the LDP believe in a fairer approach to administering the national economy. No doubt, all of you listening are worried about taxes, and so you should be. The Christian Democratic Alliance have said nothing about their plans to alter the tax brackets, and these are changes that will go straight to the pockets of hard-working people like yourselves, and we all know where the social liberal Democrats stand on this issue. They'll be taxing everything in sight. However, we in the LDP believe in a fairer approach to administering the national economy. Question 3. You overhear a hotel receptionist speaking on the telephone with a customer. Hello, Halfway Hotel. Can I help you? Yes, we take bookings. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm very sorry, but I don't think we'll be able to manage that. I suggest you try ringing the Spa Hotel in Tunbridge Wells. They have over twice the number of rooms we have and offer very much the same facilities and standards, although you will end up paying rather more. Hello, Halfway Hotel, can I help you? Yes, we take bookings. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm very sorry, but I don't think we'll be able to manage that. I suggest you try ringing the Spa Hotel in Tunbridge Wells. They have over twice the number of rooms we have and offer very much the same facilities and standards, although you will end up paying rather more. Question 4. You overhear this woman talking to her child in a shop. And now we're just dying to see the next episode, to see if they really... Kylie, put that down. It doesn't belong to you. 
I said, put it down. How many times have I told you not to touch things that don't belong to you? Now, where were we? And now we're just dying to see the next episode to see if they really... Kylie, put that down. It doesn't belong to you. I said, put it down. How many times have I told you not to touch things that don't belong to you? Now, where were we? Question 5. You overhear this woman talking about a problem she had with a CD player. Anyway, the CD was in the machine. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't play it and I was worried because I wasn't sure if it was still under guarantee. I was also furious because it was Angie's favourite album. So I took the whole machine along to Luntham's service counter, expecting to hear the worst. And they were wonderful. Said they'd been getting quite a lot of the same complaint about that model and he fixed it right there in front of me and I didn't have to pay a penny. Not like some shops I could mention. Anyway, the CD was in the machine. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't play it and I was worried because I wasn't sure if it was still under guarantee. I was also furious because it was Angie's favourite album. So I took the whole machine along to Luntham's service counter, expecting to hear the worst. And they were wonderful. Said they'd been getting quite a lot of the same complaint about that model. And he fixed it right there in front of me. And I didn't have to pay a penny. Not like some shops I could mention. Question 6. You're at a payphone in a hotel when you hear this man ordering a taxi to take him home. Yes, hello. I'd like a taxi. Yes, just one taxi. The name is Carter. Yes, I'm at the halfway hotel. I'd like to go to Radley Road, number 269. How soon can you send a cab? OK, then, that, that's fine. I'll be waiting outside the main entrance. Thank you. Yes, hello. I'd like a taxi. Yes, just one taxi. The name is Carter. Yes, I'm at the halfway hotel. I'd like to go to Radley Road, number 269. How soon can you send a cab? OK, then, that, that's fine. I'll be waiting outside the main entrance. Thank you. Question 7. You are on a train when you overhear this man talking about the prices of railway tickets. That station master was really helpful, wasn't he? I mean, he didn't have to tell me about the young person's travel card. I've just saved £3 off the full price. This ticket would have cost me £9.50, but with a card it's only £6.50 which is in fact a lot less than I paid last year, and that was before the fares increased. It was 7 50 then. Mind you, I did also have to pay £10 to buy the card, but it's going to be very useful over the next few months, what with travelling to Scotland. That station master was really helpful, wasn't he? I mean, he didn't have to tell me about the young person's travel card. I've just saved £3 off the full price. This ticket would have cost me £9.50, but with a card it's only £6.50, which is in fact a lot less than I paid last year, and that was before the fares increased. It was £7.50 then. Mind you, I did also have to pay £10 to buy the card, but it's going to be very useful over the next few months, what with travelling to Scotland. Question 8. You hear this man on the radio introducing a song. And that, of course, was the latest single from The Vegetables, and that is currently at number nine in the charts after six weeks in the top ten. And still at number one for the seventh successive week, the song that everyone loved when they first heard it, but I think we're all ready for a new number one, aren't we? Well, if you're not, here it is again, Husky Ladies from Wrap It Up. And that, of course, was the latest single from The Vegetables, and that is currently at number nine in the charts after six weeks in the top ten. 
And still at number one for the seventh successive week, the song that everyone loved when they first heard it. But I think we're all ready for a new number one, aren't we? Well, if you're not, here it is again: Husky Ladies from Wrap It Up. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a program about roller coasters. For questions nine to eighteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part two. A roller coaster is a self-inflicted techno primal jab at frail human courage with fierce names and perilous heights and no brakes on board. Yep, you pay your money to get shaken and stirred, and the amusement parks wouldn't have it any other way. Absolutely, they want bragging rights. In fact, there's been lawsuits over who has had the tallest coaster in the world and who's had the fastest and that kind of thing. So where do you go to meet the twisted minds that come up with all this twisted metal? You go to a place where there isn't even a roller coaster in sight, the shores of Utah's Great Salt Lake. Watch the G-forces right here. Aerodynamics in Clearfield, Utah. These loop artists can make you sick, but they won't. There are certain things that do that. Our experience and knowledge of what forces and geometries do to people that we won't do, that we refuse to do. It's in the shop at Arrow that the need for speed is satisfied. The cars are easy, fiberglass frames over a steel chassis. The real art comes in designing the track. The roller coaster uses gravity, energy from having been carried up a lift. The science is making sure that once that potential energy is released, there's enough to get the car back to the station. The art is spending that energy in new and interesting ways, and that means engineering maximum height, maximum drops, and maximum G's are no G's at all. The dragon fire at Bush Gardens in Wallensbury, Virginia. In that first hill, we put a parabolic curve in there, and what that does is give you about four seconds of zero G's. But above all, coasters are about maximum speed. The current record is 85 miles per hour. There's even a psychological element to coaster design. How much do you want your riders to be aware of their predicament? The coaster that doesn't look an especially very large one, speeds are very high, and you're able to comprehend everything that's going on. And there's a lot more kind of fear factor. It's it's they're scarier. They really are. And if you think these guys don't know more about throwing your body around than a pro wrestler, listen to the next step in coaster design called a pipeline. Our current coasters, when you bank into the corner, you kind of rock back and forth. But the pipeline puts the point of rotation right in the center of your chest, so that we can just flip you over really quick. And it allows you to do barrel rolls, snap rolls, aeroplane, aerobatic tap maneuvers. So that's coaster science. Make it fast, make it safe, and give it a vicious name. After that, build it, and they will come. What's the next step in roller coaster? The tallest, the fastest, the biggest indoors. Well, anyway, you got the point. Here it is: the biggest indoor coaster in the world. Grand Slam Canyon at Circus Circus in Las Vegas, a two loop with corkscrew, twenty four hundred foot, forty plus mile an hour screamer, and the next step beyond this. I think the next generation of coasters is going to have elements of riding technology that is employed currently in simulator thinking. I see a combining of those two kind of things: a coaster with digital displays, or maybe a coaster with a virtual reality helmet attached to it, so you get the G forces and you get maybe some different visual sensations, things like that. The most expensive technology in a roller coaster is in the wheels. The tires cost five times what they do in your car. The same goes for the brakes and finally a physics lesson. Any roller coaster will go faster when the air is warm but dry and when it's heavier. So if you're going to do it right, get a bunch of friends together, pack that car, and ride on a warm autumn day.
You will hear the piece again. A roller coaster is a self inflicted techno primal jab at frail human courage with fierce names and perilous heights and no brakes on board. Yep, you pay your money to get shaken and stirred. And the amusement parks wouldn't have it any other way. Absolutely, they want bragging rights. In fact, there's been lawsuits over who has had the tallest coaster in the world and who's had the fastest and that kind of thing. So where do you go to meet the twisted minds that come up with all this twisted metal? You go to a place where there isn't even a roller coaster in sight, the shores of Utah's Great Salt Lake. Watch the G-forces right here. Aerodynamics in Clearfield, Utah. These loop artists can make you sick, but they won't. There are certain things that do that. Our experience and knowledge of what forces and geometries do to people that we won't do, that we refuse to do. It's in the shop at Aero that the need for speed is satisfied. The cars are easy, fiberglass frames over a steel chassis. The real art comes in designing the track. The roller coaster uses gravity, energy from having been carried up a lift. The science is making sure that once that potential energy is released, there's enough to get the car back to the station. The art is spending that energy in new and interesting ways. And that means engineering maximum height, maximum drops, and maximum Gs are no Gs at all. The dragon fire at Bush Gardens in Wallensbury, Virginia. In that first hill, we put a parabolic curve in there. And what that does is give you about four seconds of zero Gs. But above all, coasters are about maximum speed. The current record is 85 miles per hour. There's even a psychological element to coaster design. How much do you want your riders to be aware of their predicament? The coaster that doesn't look an especially very large one, speeds are very high, and you're able to comprehend everything that's going on, and there's a lot more kind of fear factor. It's, it's they're scarier. They really are. And if you think these guys don't know more about throwing your body around than a pro wrestler, listen to the next step in coaster design, called a pipeline. Our current coasters, when you bank into the corner, you kind of rock back and forth. But the pipeline puts the point of rotation right in the center of your chest so that we can just flip you over really quick. And it allows you to do barrel rolls, snap rolls, aeroplane, aerobatic type maneuvers. So that's coaster science. Make it fast, make it safe, and give it a vicious name. After that, build it, and they will come. What's the next step in roller coaster? The tallest, the fastest, the biggest indoors. Well, anyway, you got the point. Here it is, the biggest indoor coaster in the world. Grand Slam Canyon at Circus Circus in Las Vegas. A two-loop with corkscrew, 2,400 foot, 40 plus mile an hour screamer. And the next step beyond this? I think the next generation of coasters is going to have elements of riding technology that is employed currently in simulator thinking. I see a combining of those two kind of things. A coaster with digital displays, or maybe a coaster with a virtual reality helmet attached to it, so you get the G-forces, and you get maybe some different visual sensations, things like that. The most expensive technology in a roller coaster is in the wheels. The tires cost five times what they do in your car. The same goes for the brakes and finally a physics lesson. Any roller coaster will go faster when the air is warm but dry, and when it's heavier. So if you're going to do it right, get a bunch of friends together, pack that car, and ride on a warm autumn day. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear five different people being interviewed on the radio about Christmas. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to H which words best describe their feelings about this celebration. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds in which to look through part 3. Speaker 1 Well, I suppose some of it was quite nice, but it really could have been so much better. After all, I went to a lot of effort this year to make it something special, but somehow it didn't quite work. 
I mean, everybody had masses to eat. There were eight of us sitting down to dinner, and we must have spent a fortune on presents this year. But looking around the room, you couldn't see it in people's faces. And then there was all the quarrelling over what we were going to watch on TV. And I don't seem to remember a single person actually saying thank you and really meaning it. Speaker 2 I was all set to have another unexciting Christmas in the bedsitter where I'm living now. Of course I'd sent my kids Christmas presents, but I knew I wouldn't be hearing from them. My ex-wife doesn't allow it. So I bought myself a two-pound chicken from Dewhurst's and a four-pack of Lime Brand Extra, and I got a stack of pound coins for the electric meter so that at least I could be warm and watch some telly. And then... Just as I was putting the chicken into the oven, there was a knock at the door, and it was the father of the family just across the road, saying they noticed that I was going to be alone that day, and would I like to join them. And of course, I had a wonderful time. Speaker 3 It isn't over yet. I mean, we've had the actual festivities on the 25th, but there's so much more to Christmas than that. Our parish church is putting on a festival of nine lessons and carols on Sunday evening. And if that's not your cup of tea, then there's the Charitable Association, Santa Claus Pram Race on Monday, although I won't be taking part in that this year. And this Christmas it's even been snowing, so I'll be taking my grandchildren up to Coniston Hill for some tobogganing. Or they can build a snowman if the snow's good enough. That's on Tuesday. And then... Speaker 4 It wasn't as good as it's been in the past. For a start, the telly was pretty disappointing, especially after last year's. I mean, we had Terminator last Christmas Eve, but all we got this year was Robocop again. And the weather, <laughs> the weather's been really bad, so most of the football was cancelled. And then to top it all, our video machine broke down on Christmas Day, so there's been nothing to watch all Christmas. And then, just to finish off any last chance of a decent holiday, someone suggested we all play Monopoly. Well, I went out to walk the dog in the snow. Speaker 5 Well, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I spent the three days before the 25th standing outside Fielding's Pet Shop with a placard trying to stop people buying pets as presents. And did they listen? People were going in and out of the pet shop all day and you should have seen the number of baby cats, dogs and rabbits that people were buying as presents. And you know what's going to happen to them, the same as every year. A week after Christmas, they'll be out on the streets, fending for themselves in temperatures well below zero. But what's most distressing is the tropical birds. These beautiful animals can die in a matter of hours if left outside. You will hear the piece again. Speaker 1 well, I suppose some of it was quite nice, but it really could have been so much better. After all, I went to a lot of effort this year to make it something special, but somehow it didn't quite work. I mean, everybody had masses to eat. There were eight of us sitting down to dinner, and we must have spent a fortune on presents this year. But looking around the room, you couldn't see it in people's faces. And then there was all the quarrelling over what we were going to watch on TV. And I don't seem to remember a single person actually saying thank you and really meaning it. Speaker 2 I was all set to have another unexciting Christmas in the bedsitter where I'm living now. Of course I'd sent my kids Christmas presents, but I knew I wouldn't be hearing from them. My ex-wife doesn't allow it. So I bought myself a two-pound chicken from Dewhurst's and a four-pack of Lime Brand Extra, and I got a stack of pound coins for the electric meter so that at least I could be warm and watch some telly. And then, just as I was putting the chicken into the oven, there was a knock at the door, and it was the father of the family just across the road, saying they noticed that I was going to be alone that day, and would I like to join them. And of course, I had a wonderful time.
Speaker 3. It isn't over yet. I mean, we've had the actual festivities on the 25th, but there's so much more to Christmas than that. Our parish church is putting on a festival of nine lessons and carols on Sunday evening. And if that's not your cup of tea, then there's the Charitable Association, Santa Claus Pram Race on Monday, although I won't be taking part in that this year. And this Christmas it's even been snowing, so I'll be taking my grandchildren up to Coniston Hill for some tobogganing. Or they can build a snowman if the snow's good enough. That's on Tuesday. And then... Speaker 4 It wasn't as good as it's been in the past. For a start, the telly was pretty disappointing, especially after last year's. I mean, we had Terminator last Christmas Eve, but all we got this year was Robocop again. And the weather, <laughs> the weather's been really bad. So most of the football was cancelled. And then to top it all, our video machine broke down on Christmas Day, so there's been nothing to watch all Christmas. And then, just to finish off any last chance of a decent holiday, someone suggested we all play Monopoly. Well, I went out to walk the dog in the snow. Speaker 5 Well, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I spent the three days before the 25th standing outside Fielding's Pet Shop with a placard trying to stop people buying pets as presents. And did they listen? People were going in and out of the pet shop all day and you should have seen the number of baby cats, dogs and rabbits that people were buying as presents. And you know what's going to happen to them, the same as every year. A week after Christmas, they'll be out on the streets, fending for themselves in temperatures well below zero. But what's most distressing is the tropical birds. These beautiful animals can die in a matter of hours if left outside. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear an extract from a radio program. For questions 24 to 30, decide which of the choices A, B or C is the correct answer. There will now be a pause of one minute for you to look through part four. Hi, this is Say It Like It Is, the programme in which your comments about what's been on Radio 1 for the last week are read. And for today, well, we had many listeners writing in about last Tuesday's science programme, which was based on weather this time. John Holmes from Oxford says, Your climate changes turned out to be quite an interesting programme. Professor Jones's theory that we're slowly going towards another ice age was quite astounding. I was taught that the Earth was moving nearer the Sun. You could be right, but I don't think that will happen in our lifetime. Mrs Kent from Brighton talks about weather problems which could affect us in the near future. Some experts may tell us what the weather may be like in the next century, but I'm more concerned about the present-day situation. I think that tax money and scientific studies should try to focus on short-term weather forecasts and try to make them more precise and accurate. Many listeners have the same point of view. On the other hand, Tom Sheridan from Manchester has a different opinion. I hear that experiments are being made to change the weather in Britain. But who wants it? Nobody would like a set weather pattern. All those conversations about the weather would disappear. 
we'd find something else to talk about, I'm sure. Food, for example. It seems to be a favourite of our readers, judging from the letters we receive. Dear Jim, I'm writing in objection to the cookery series on Wednesdays. Tim Saunders from Coventry writes, Most men already know how to do things like making toast, so our time shouldn't be wasted by such programmes. Tim would like more challenging cooking tips. We've got the producer of our cookery show here today, Mr Paul Spencer. What about more difficult cookery on your show? I can relate to what Mr Saunders is saying. Up to now we've been doing basic things to help beginners, but we'll be moving on to more difficult recipes in the next few weeks. I hope that the programme will be more interesting for Mr Saunders in the future. I hope so. To finish off, we have a few letters referring to the rumours that lending libraries won't be free to the public anymore. Jane from Bournemouth has a few things to say about this. For students like me, books are too expensive to buy and we depend on libraries for our books. 20p is too much to pay for every book we take out. Don't worry, Jane. It's only a rumour so far. And our last letter comes from one of the elderly in our community. Well, the elderly have to pay for their needs, so why shouldn't others pay for theirs? They pay in pubs and discos. Why not at libraries? Well, that's all for today. More for you to think about. If there's something you'd like to comment on, write to Jim Adams. Say it like it is, Radio 1. You will hear the piece again. Hi. This is Say It Like It Is, the programme in which your comments about what's been on Radio 1 for the last week are read. And for today, well, we had many listeners writing in about last Tuesday's science programme, which was based on weather this time. John Holmes from Oxford says, Your climate changes turned out to be quite an interesting programme. Professor Jones's theory that we're slowly going towards another ice age was quite astounding. I was taught that the Earth was moving nearer the sun. You could be right, but I don't think that will happen in our lifetime. Mrs Kent from Brighton talks about weather problems which could affect us in the near future. Some experts may tell us what the weather may be like in the next century, but I'm more concerned about the present-day situation. I think that tax money and scientific studies should try to focus on short-term weather forecasts and try to make them more precise and accurate. Many listeners have the same point of view. On the other hand... Tom Sheridan from Manchester has a different opinion. I hear that experiments are being made to change the weather in Britain. But who wants it? Nobody would like a set weather pattern. All those conversations about the weather would disappear. We'd find something else to talk about, I'm sure. Food, for example. It seems to be a favourite of our readers, judging from the letters we receive. Dear Jim, I'm writing in objection to the cookery series on Wednesdays. Tim Saunders from Coventry writes, Most men already know how to do things like making toast, so our time shouldn't be wasted by such programmes. Tim would like more challenging cooking tips. We've got the producer of our cookery show here today, Mr Paul Spencer. What about more difficult cookery on your show? I can relate to what Mr Saunders is saying. Up to now we've been doing basic things to help beginners, but we'll be moving on to more difficult recipes in the next few weeks. I hope that the programme will be more interesting for Mr Saunders in the future. I hope so. To finish off, we have a few letters referring to the rumours that lending libraries won't be free to the public anymore. Jane from Bournemouth has a few things to say about this. For students like me, books are too expensive to buy and we depend on libraries for our books. 20p is too much to pay for every book we take out. Don't worry, Jane. It's only a rumour so far. And our last letter comes from one of the elderly in our community. The elderly have to pay for their needs, so why shouldn't others pay for theirs? They pay in pubs and discos. Why not at libraries? Well, that's all for today. More for you to think about. If there's something you'd like to comment on, write to Jim Adams. Say it like it is, Radio 1. That is the end of Part 4. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. Pause for four minutes. You have one more minute left.
That is the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets.